All righty. Well, good morning. We, uh, we welcome you to, to church here at South End United Methodist this morning as we will uh, be joining together in worship and, and praise and trying to take a breather in the midst of one crazy hectic week and maybe catch our breath uh, and center ourselves in, in telling and hearing the story of God before we step into another um, hectic and, and busy week as we know them to be. Uh, I also invite you to, to join us in Sunday school on, on Sunday mornings, especially this Sunday where we're kind of lucky that the the service you're about to experience and the Sunday school conversation are kind of really working together in many ways as we will be having a conversation about um, demons and demon possession and, and exorcisms in the, the Gospel of Mark, you know, light, light-hearted, easy stuff on a, on a Sunday morning. And then this upcoming Wednesday night, we will really kind of begin and dive into the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors and and dreams, and interpretations, and, and good old family strife, which we tend to talk about a lot, of, a lot about in the, in the book of Genesis. So please join us for those, those conversations, and those dialogues, and uh, the opinions, and the ideas that come out really are fun, and, and inspiring, and, and, and insightful in, in many ways. And like, like your newsletter pointed out uh, earlier this week, we have a few more uh, Room in the Inn weekends coming down the pipe, one of which will I guess I've already happened by the time uh, you join us in worship this morning, but it's almost every other week um, at this point. So please um, step forward and, and help us in that ministry in this time, especially today on Thursday when it's gotten pretty cold, uh, pretty fast. We're doing what we can um, to fill that gap and provide a, a warm and clean and, and, and safe place for, for that ministry alongside the mission. But really... Uh, Without any further ado, please, please take a deep breath and maybe just collect yourself in silence for, for a few minutes and, and join us in, in praise and, and worship and peace in a morning of boundary breaking. Amen.
Please join me as we open in prayer this morning. O God, as you anointed leaders and called them prophets of old, lead us to recognize our true representatives and authentic leaders today. Please empower men and women who who love your people and can walk with them, who feel their pain and share their joys, who dream their dreams and strive to accompany them to their common goal. So with your fire and with your spirit, embolden and commission us to transform all our systems to serve your people and to live as your people and to bring real, authentic, embodied glory to your name. Amen. Please join with me as we read together responsively Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Full of honor and majesty are the works of the Lord, whose righteousness endures forever. Who has caused his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord provides food for the faithful and is ever mindful of his covenant. The Lord has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of the Lord's hands are faithful and just. The precepts of the Lord are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. The Lord sent redemption to his people and has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and wondrous is God's name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. The praise of the Lord endures forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. of the, in some sense, the end of our little series on, on some of the, the symbols and emblems and what they mean up here in, in church and, and on the altar. I don't know about you, but I always wondered what that IHS meant on, on all these pyramids up in the front of church. When I coached it at Franklin High School, I couldn't see IHS without thinking about Independence High School, so I always had a hard time looking at altars and taking them seriously sometimes in, in church. So what does this IHS mean or, or stand for? I used to think it was an acronym and would try to come up with what, what sentence made sense for church that IHS would be the representative letters. And it's actually, like a lot of things, it's representing uh, old traditions and, and language in church, you know, kind of like you've seen how I write God's name with a G, a dash, and a, a D. Well, to the early writers in the early church, they would usually write Christ or Jesus just by writing the first two letters of the name and writing a line above it or below it. So, so Christ would have just been written, you know, C-H or Cairo uh, with a line and so in many ways, this, this IHS is to represent the, the, first, the first three letters of Jesus' name in, in Greek, um, iota, uh, eta, and, and sigma. And so this IHS is actually to say the name of Jesus in, in our church and to put the name of Jesus first, first and, and foremost visually in a lot of 
different ways, but also hearkening back to the traditions of the early church of those first three Greek letters and how that traditionally was, was how people would have read the name of Jesus. So, now you know what IHS means, but then the other interesting challenge about this is, as we've talked about the colors and these symbols that maybe sometimes we, we forget or we take for granted, is that when we bring friends and family and, and new people into church is to, to share those little nuggets of, of information, to ask our friends and, and family, hey, do you know why everything's green? Do you know what that IHS stands for? Do you know what these colors and these symbols mean? Because they might not. And it has a way to, to, to share the story and, and to keep those images fresh and not just, not just forget about them and take them for, for granted. So now you know that we have the, the name of, of Jesus draped and, and hanging up front and first and foremost in and a lot of our churches, pyramids and, and decorations year, year long. Amen. Scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark in the opening chapter once again, but this time we find ourselves in verses 21 through 28. Um, and depending on the subheadings of your Bible, mine labels this passage of Scripture as the man with an unclean spirit. They went to Capernaum, and, and when the Sabbath had come, he entered the synagogue and began to teach, and they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And just then, there in the synagogue was a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you come to do with us, O Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. I know that you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And then the unclean spirit convulsing him and, and crying out with a loud voice came out of him, and they were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, what, what is this? What is this new 
teaching? What is this new authority? He commands and even the unclean spirits, they obey and they listen to him. And at once his fame began to spread all throughout the surrounding regions of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. One of the reasons I love the Gospel of Mark is that it, it doesn't really waste any time getting to the point. It doesn't spend a whole lot of time setting the, the table. It doesn't devote a whole lot of energy towards establishing a, a clear thesis or a clear Christology to define who Jesus is. Now, it's very clear that Mark is going to get down to the point quickly, but he does right from the jump, depict Jesus as one who is somehow uniquely authorized, commissioned, and empowered to articulate what the reign of God should or might look like. That's how the table is set. And then through this authority, through these teachings, we begin to glimpse characteristics of what this reign of God could be. We know very clearly in in the opening sentences of Mark that it is an intrusive, invasive breaking of old boundaries. It is an onslaught. It is the inbreaking of God that is coming against, over, and through all Walls that were erected and and benefited systems and powers of old. That it's a story about liberating people from the powers that that afflict them from the depths of their soul or from from outside of their being. It's, It's about going against any power that keeps creation from flourishing. These teachings with authority were about articulating God's wants and intentions for the world. That those wants were about defying and and reconfiguring some traditions that needed to be reshaped and reformed in the process. Because all good construction always involves a certain amount of deconstruction along the way. So what does an exorcism reveal to us about Jesus in the opening sentences of Mark. Maybe it's a challenge to ask us to to remember Jesus as Jesus the exorcist. To really first know Jesus as an exorcist and and not just as Jesus the teacher, or Jesus the shepherd, or, or Jesus the savior, or Jesus the king. Mark is going to use this image and this role of Jesus primarily as an exorcist over and over and over again in this story. So what does this image, what does this role reveal to us about who Jesus is? See, this is what I like about Mark. Mark Mark is very clear and and blunt and, and to the point, but you have to read between the lines. You have to ask some extra questions in Mark. You have to really take some of these stories and ask, so what? Mark will give you the what, but it's our job to ask the the so what. It's our job to ask the extra questions. What and why this image of Jesus primarily is an exorcist? I would tell you that it it shows us that Jesus was a a boundary breaker. Jesus was an an invader. And that this exorcism confirms that role exponentially, that it that in this role it reveals that God too is a boundary breaking God. That this man with an unclean spirit speaks out in the midst of of church, in the midst of temple, in the midst of of synagogue, and essentially says, why have you come to pick this fight? Why Why have you come to change the way things have always been? Couldn't you just have left things the way they 
were. Why did you have to come in and upset the homeostasis we exist within? But something about Jesus' sheer presence in the synagogue that day had crossed a line. Something about the presence of Jesus, the presence of God, breaks some rules, picks some fights, upsets some apple carts, and crosses a line that nobody thought ever would have been crossed. This imagery is all over Mark. Each and every boundary we put into place, even these boundaries that we perceive to be impenetrable, in Mark's story, God breaks and bursts right through them. Political, social, religious, ethical, racial, sexual, even cosmic boundaries. God in this story is, is breaking down and crossing those lines. It's, it's kind of like the old cartoons where, where Bugs Bunny will look at Yosemite Sam and drag his foot across the sand and go across this line and, and Jesus and God crosses it. How about this one? And, and, and Jesus crosses it again. It is a, an habitual line-stepping God. Even to the point where the very final boundary, which we persist to keep thinking is beyond God's ability to shatter, is even the boundary of death. And, and even Bugs Bunny draws that line in the sand of, of death in the story of Mark as a, as a God, as a Jesus that, that even steps cross that line, that even crosses that boundary boldly, intrusively, invasively. So in many ways, this imagery of Jesus the exorcist is the only logical first act of ministry for Mark to write about. This can't start with a sermon. It can't start with a miracle. It, it can't start with a healing. It has to start with a story of stepping across the line into a realm of opposing, conflicting enemy supremacies. The story of God stepping into the world of other spirits, stepping into the arena of powerful, possessing spirits and proclaiming, God is here now, let the games begin. That this has to start with the story of God breaking through the barrier that holds all the evil of the universe. It has to start with the story of God stepping into the places and spaces where it seems that God would never be. God stepping into the presence that seems so opposite of God. See, Mark just isn't making this stuff up. He isn't conjuring these ideas out of nowhere. See, see, Mark knows and believes the words of the prophet Isaiah that there's something about heralding the good news is to herald the good news and the good tidings of saying that what it means to, to tell that story is to say, your God reigns, your God is, is here. God has shown up even here. God has crossed the boundaries, and is finally here. I think about a few years ago, I was helping Granddaddy and, and Grand and Uncle Price. We were out at the farm, and we were getting ready for the 4th of July, and we always had a family reunion on the, the 4th of July, and so I was finally considered big enough to, to take part in weed whacking. I don't know why that felt like such a promotion at the time, and I was excited to to do the weed whacking. A few hours later, I wished I was smaller to where I didn't have to do the weed whacking. So, you know, sometimes that's how life goes. So I was out weed whacking along the side of one of the, the flower beds, and Uncle Price comes over and signaled to me to, to shut that thing off. And he walks up, he goes, son, do you want to weed whack every week? He's like, this isn't better homes and gardens. He goes, this isn't about making it all level to perfectly match the, the rest of the lawn. He goes, you could do that. But he says, you'll be out here doing this again in five days. He says, I, listen, it's, unless you want to do this every week, he says, 
I don't know about you, because I like to weed whack about three times a summer. So he says, let's turn that blade down, and I want to see dirt, Bubba. I'm like, let's, let's get these weeds gone. That's how Caleb and I weed whack. So if you really want a pretty better homes and garden lawn, you don't want to call us to, to weed whack, because we only want to do that about two, three times a, a summer. We really get after those, those weeds. We try to, to scorch those, those edges. Maybe by now you realize what I'm trying to do with this parable. That there's something about these weeds that represent the, the forces of, of evil, that represent the demons in this story. There's something about the power of evil and, and the power of demonic forces that is, is always constantly growing. It's never stagnant. It's never neutral and so in many ways you can't ever ignore it or or turn your back on it because it can quickly get out of hand you have to constantly be vigilant about these forces it might be something you have to be very aware of of maintaining and keeping in check every few weeks or maybe you have to take such a hard line stance to face these forces of evil to try to really go at the roots and and not have to worry about it for for a little bit, that you can't turn your back or it gets out of hand, that in many ways it's an either or proposition. You are either, they are either coming at you or you are, are going at them. It is one or the other. I think this works in a lot of ways that, that we can't turn our backs on the power of evil in this world because they are continually trying to, to grow back and, and overcome and and build new boundaries and, and, and new fortresses. That just about the time you think you have it all figured out, that you have, have defeated the power of evil in, in your personal life or, or your family life, that, that the power of evil is already trying to start back up and, 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 and redirect itself and, and develop a new tactic to, to pinch or move or to sneak around the back door and, and come into your life. It's just about the time you think you have all your personal demons in check that they are just seeking to spurt and and, and spike back up again. It's in those moments that they are just seeking to grow back in in full glory, waiting for you to turn your back, waiting for you to, to get complacent. It has to either be you going at them or them coming at you. In many ways, it is the ever present problem of of weed whacking. And in this sense, I know we think of of demons and and, and demon possession and and exorcisms as as almost mythical, distanced stories. Something that maybe was just used for for imagery and, and hyperbole by the gospel writers. I would challenge and ask us to to think of demons and and the forces of evil as an ever-present reality as well. Really, any any turning on of of the news or or following of of local radio reports can or should affirm that reality. If we look at crime rates in the United States, that it was a pretty level graph until about 1970, and then somehow, some way, you begin to see just an absolute exponential vertical spike ever, ever since. That if you look at, at crime rates and FBI ports, reports, you just see a continual rise in, in assaults and, and rapes and and violence all across the United States, or really all across the world, can you not see that demons could and maybe are a present reality for us today? For many people and many families, and and if we were here in this room, if we were here at, at church, it would be a reminder to sit there and think that even in the midst of all these houses and apartments and families that, that surround us, that 
were probably at least more than just a few households right within a stone's throw of our sanctuary. Violence, abuse, and addiction are an everyday reality for them. These weeds of demonic forces have been growing and gotten a little out of hand because maybe somewhere, somehow, we turned our backs on them and we forgot to worry about it. There are all types of statistics that are almost all too sobering that point to this reality. That almost 30% of, of, of all girls and, and, and females before the age of 18 will experience some form of, of sexual abuse. That, that almost 1 in 10 boys before the age of 18 will experience some form, form of abuse. We can't look at these statistics and not, not say that the devil's alive and well. That demonic forces aren't just something Mark wrote about thousands of years ago. I wonder sometimes if in church we don't give the devil enough credit. We don't give demons enough credit. Probably because it's not easy or fun to talk about, right? There's so many different angles we could, we could speak and, and, and name and statistics we could use to tell the very real reality that, that demon possession and that the demon's presence in this world is very tangible. We just maybe started calling it something else. But we have to find ways to, to combat these forces. We have to find ways to go at the roots of these weeds. We have to find ways to get out the weed whackers of our life. We have to find ways to be vigilant in this fight against these forces of evil. We can do and face these fights many different ways in, in our society. Many different ways, and even even in many, I, I could sit there and say maybe that the conversation has to start in in the political and, and active realm. And I know there's always a weird spot when we start to use the word politics in, in church from from the pulpit. People start to get nervous and and wonder where exactly this is going. Whenever you use the word politics in church, everybody starts to to fidget a little differently. Like the the fibers on the carpet in front of your pulpit get real real interesting. Um, that's what's good about doing this in front of a camera. I don't have to see those nervous reactions, right? But we have to be honest that, that there's so much violence in our culture and it, it might be related to or aided and assisted by, by the laws that take place and are enforced or, or not enforced in our world. I believe that there are certain laws that need to be in, enforced or, or dealt with or handled differently to help combat these forces of evil in, in very particular pointed ways. This violence has become such a, a reality and, and so much more uh, vivid and tangible in ways that we have to, to face it with a unified front. We have to face it face on. I think about the fact that whenever I walk into a, to a high school to coach and to work with athletics, I see signs of, of no guns allowed. That has just become a reality to go through, through metal detectors and to think about the, the accessibility of guns. And um, I've been in the Army now for 13 years. Like I spend a lot of time almost professionally around guns, and I have a hard time whenever we go to a gun range to think that any normal civilian would need these <laughs> for anything uh, in their life. So maybe a conversation of, of, of accessibility to, to, to guns and, and, and the reality of that and, and the violence of what these machines can do needs to be dealt with differently. Where does that conversation start other than with legislation and and political conversations. We need to take a look at, at the laws within our country that, that allow 
such a degree of poverty to exist within our cities. We might be one of the richest countries in, in the world, but somehow in the, in the inner hearts of many cities, we have third world levels of, of poverty, and it is almost a crime against humanity that, that we, the United States of America, have allowed that to exist. We've allowed those weeds to grow. We have allowed those demons of, of poverty and violence to, to become so at home and comfortable in our inner cities. There's almost a direct correlation between saying that the, the primary cause of violence in America is, is due to poverty. Maybe that's what this conversation on, on demonic forces and, and the forces of evil and, and where they take root and, and where they come from and, and where they pop up in our life. We have to, to have these conversations. And so maybe I'm just trying to suggest and, and brainstorm and think aloud this morning, and I, I don't know the answers. I'm not saying that. But maybe some of the answers could be found in our policies and and laws, and leaders. Maybe the best way to get to the roots of these weeds, to go after these demons in the best way possible, might be for responsible Christians to go out and, and, and do something in the social and political realms. To try to help our country, our, our towns, our cities, and our states reduce the amount of poverty, and violence that is existing within the gardens of our life. See, to me, that's how maybe we have to talk about exorcisms and demon possessions today. And while it's, it's not easy and it's not fun to say a whole lot of these words in, in front of people, I, I think it's a fight we have to pick. I think it's a line we have to cross if we are going to follow in the footsteps of of what it means to be followers of Christ, we have to live a life in such a way that when we show up in places, demons sit there and say, why couldn't you have just left things the way they were? Why did you choose this fight to pick? We have to lead and follow that example. Maybe we have a lot of different, different opinions about where all these, these illnesses and evils and, and demons come from, and what it means to acknowledge and, and combat all these different forces. And maybe in the labeling of all these different forces, we've tried to act like they're, they're other people's problems, but I think maybe that was, was just the demon's intention, that in, in the midst of us looking at all these demons, that we've labeled a lot of them to be issues of, 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 of spiritual or sociological or anthropological anthropological, man, sometimes those words sound great on paper until you got to say them out loud, habitual or political or biological or, or climatological, that a lot of these demons just can't be clearly divided into categories. And when we try to put them into categories, we just act like they're somebody else's problem. They somehow are, are able to, to stay out of our purview or they're somebody else's issue to try to control. Maybe at minimum, this opening story of Jesus as an exorcist provokes us to stop assuming that the way things have always been has to be the way things are. Maybe at minimum, this opening story of a, a boundary line crossing Jesus going after the forces of evil wakes us up to weak start not believing the old lie of, well, that's the way we've always done it. That the reign of God that, that Jesus articulates and, and gives us glimpses of in the Gospel of Mark doesn't have to just be a far-off, distant future. That in this season of epiphany, we, we devote ourselves to celebrating and considering the means by which Christ becomes known in new ways to the world. So what do we do with a boundary-breaking story? 
What do we do with knowing Jesus as an exorcist? What do we do with thinking about we have to go at these forces of evil? Maybe the answer is found just a chapter or so later in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus appoints 12 apostles and He says basically go out and first preach the Gospel. and Secondly, cast out demons. These 12 apostles, these 12 followers of Jesus were the beginning of a church and that church's mission was crystal clear in two steps, to preach the gospel and to cast out demons. Somehow we forgot the second part of what it means to to cast out demons and to go picking those fights. I guess the question is, is, do we really look at these evil demons and weeds in our life, and do we really want to wait for Jesus to eventually show up to get it taken care of, for Jesus to to get out God's weed whacker and finally cut back these these bushes for this celebration to start? We just want to wait for that ultimate one day for God to take care of it, and we'll just live in a demon-possessed world in the meantime? That doesn't sound fun. We haven't even dealt well with the fact of just sitting at home for, for nine months. Why, why are we accepting just to live in a demon-possessed world? Why, why have we just given up for the past 40 years to sit on our hands and wait for God to show up and do something about it? Maybe it's time to think of demons more. Maybe it's time to name these demons. Maybe it's time to, to gas up your weed whackers to get out in the yards of your life and to start cutting these bad boys back. I want to see dirt. I don't want to have to keep fighting these fights. I don't know about you, I want to stop turning on the news and seeing demons very clearly, everly present on our news channels and newspapers and and radio shows, but then we come into church and we act like this is a bygone, forgotten language. So let's start preaching the gospel and casting out demons. Amen. I know... I say all that to say that I think a lot of the the prayer requests and the, the issues and the needs and the illnesses and the depression and the addictions we we think of and, and we share and and we talk about on on day to day that we would come together to lift up and in terms of prayer requests, if we were gathered in in person worship, that is the beginning of this spiritual warfare of, of naming and going against these demons. Please, please bow your heads with me in prayer this evening. Yahweh, we first say we're we're sorry that we turned our back. We're sorry that we somehow let the yard get out of control and then it just became too big a process to even think about starting on our own. So we pray for the energy and the authority to cross these boundaries. cast out demons out of this world. We pray tonight and we pray today cast out the demons of sickness, cast out the demons of weariness, of fatigue, 
fatigue, injuries, cast out the demons of depression, lack of motivation, cast out the demons of isolation, loneliness, all the forms that we know how to name, that we know what to look for, and even the forms that we don't know about yet. Help us in these fights. Help us and empower us that when we say, come out of them, come out of us, leave us and get out of our life, because we were called to live for so much more. They will listen, not because we say it, because you are saying it through us. So help us continue to pray the same prayer you taught us to pray by saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for Thank you.
mission to go forth and do two things, to preach and spread the gospel and the good news, and to cast out demons. That's what we're trying to do here at South End United Methodist, even in a weird times such as these. We know the good news can take on many forms. If you're hungry, good news is food. 
cold, good news is warmth. If you're trapped, good news is freedom. We try to preach and spread and share the good news in the various forms that it has in this world. And then maybe we're trying to find what lines need to be crossed and what fights need to be picked in order to begin doing that second part of, of casting out demons. Trying to cast out and get rid of demons of, of violence, abuse, and addictions in this world. I'm not saying we have the answers yet. But if we put our heads and our hands together, we can start to come up with a few ways of going about doing and getting rid of these evil forces in the meantime. Let's work on this together as we try to come home and be the apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ.